a manufacturing giant. Now 70% of us provide services instead. You don't like it, McDonald's is hiring. Our middle class is shrinking. Our standard of living is threatened. Who's to blame? Like the American motor car industry let me down. I didn't let them down. I didn't abandon them. They abandoned me. Can the American dream survive? Where do we turn for answers? American businessmen have all kinds of excuses. They never blame themselves. Will we ever again be able to proudly say, Made in America? Major funding for Made in America is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which supports these programs as a contribution to public understanding of technology and industry. Additional funding provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Corporate funding is provided by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for over 100 years providing business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers in established and emerging global markets. Sometimes I think it's a real shame that the United States doesn't really have its act together in manufacturing. Say it goes Walkman's TVs and minivans and wonder where our money all goes. Just working for the Japanese, for little cars and color TVs, spending all our money overseas to the eastern sphere. One day we're gonna lose our roots, wear Oriental jeans and boots, and drink nothing but Kawasaki, Saki, Honda, wine and Mitsubishi light beer. Gonna love that Kawasaki, Saki, Honda, wine and Mitsubishi light beer. Now, there's a catchy tune, working for the Japanese. But is it true? The myth is that Japan is taking over America. The reality, Britain owns more of this country than Japan. I'm Robert Reich. Most of the time, I teach at a university and write about American society and the economy, trying to overcome such myths. Tonight, I'm your guide to some startling new realities that affect all of us. Most of us grew up in a world shaped by the Second World War. Europe was in ruins, Japan was beaten. An unchallenged America dominated the world's economy. The symbols of our success were the products we manufactured and exported around the world. Coca-Cola, Kodak, Ford, IBM. Made in America was the world's standard of excellence. You still find American brands wherever you go, but there's heavy competition from abroad, and not just from Japan. This year marks the start of a newly integrated, powerful European economy. Many might wish we could turn the clock back to the days of American supremacy, but everyone knows that we cannot. Luckily, this is not a contest which permits only one winner. There's plenty of room for America to succeed at the same time other nations prosper. Tonight, we search for ways to assure that all Americans have the opportunity to be winners in the new global economy. We begin where any economy begins, in the market, buying and selling supply and demand. But today's hottest markets don't sell food. They hawk consumer electronics. Semiconductor chips, calculators, Walkmen, palm top computers, and much, much more. On sale here in Japan, the world's hottest electronics market. The increasing wealth of the Japanese and their love of technology creating a booming consumer market for almost anything high-tech. Japan has replaced us as the global test market for high-tech products. The Japanese stock market may have its problems, but that hasn't affected Japanese technology. These state-of-the-art televisions using flat panel technology are a little more than one inch thick. They're part of one of the biggest trends in Japan today. 
tiny TVs. Some hot new products are not small at all. High definition television, something only talked about in America, is on sale here now and finding a market despite its $17,000 price tag. Short runs of many products hit this market, but only a few take off, get fine-tuned, and exported to America and the rest of the world. What succeeds here will join the thousands of other Japanese electronics products flooding the American market each year. It wasn't always that way. In 1970, American companies controlled virtually the entire U.S. color television market. 20 years later, American companies make almost no color televisions. So who's to blame? From color televisions to cars to VCRs, you've heard the complaints. Japan doesn't play fair. Japan blocks America's imports. Japan runs off with our inventions. Some of this is true. But is it the main problem with America's competitiveness? Certainly, if you listen to a lot of American politicians and business leaders, you'd think so. Japan is our national nemesis, the country we love to hate. But when you're tempted to blame Japan for America's problems, ask yourself, who's not producing quality products? Who's not educating its workforce? Who's not saving and investing for the future? Whose economy is dominated by financial wheeling and dealing? The secrets of Japan's success and of our own shortcomings may provide some lessons for us all. American companies have long prided themselves on the quality of their research and development. So why haven't our products been the equal of the Japanese in the marketplace? One answer is that Japanese companies typically spend 80% of their research and development improving products, making them better, making them cheaper. American companies spend 80% of their research and development testing new ideas and creating new products, but only 20% on improving existing ones. There are other reasons. In the case of American managers I've been comparing, their technical and scientific knowledge is abysmal, never mind the engineers and so forth. As a result, just the, whenever American corporations run into the market problems, customers are not buying their products. They always try to seek financial, legal, or political solutions. There is no such thing as the political solutions uh, or legal solutions or financial solutions when customers are not buying your product. You have to develop a new product. Education, therefore, is a key to the success of a high-tech product. To create successful products, a company has to be closely in touch with its customers. This is an important key to the Japanese success story. They are exquisitely sensitive to consumers. This bathroom showroom is really a listening post for consumer wants. In this laboratory, the customers are the experimenters. This couple is designing a bathroom, picking fixture styles, colors for tub and tile, all part of a growing trend toward customers designing products to fit their unique needs. The customer's preferences are recorded by computer and showroom staff. We, of course, present a choice of products to our customers here. It is our role to provide customers new information and suggest more comfortable living arrangements. On the other hand, this showroom's role is also to ask customers what they are looking for in these products. We then feed back that information to our planning or development department. And they incorporate these ideas into new products that come back to our showroom. That is our cycle of product development. The manufacturer and consumer are becoming ever more closely connected to successful innovation. Listening carefully to consumers brought an important bit of news. The Japanese could be sold a hands-off toilet. Now this improbable device, washes you with water, dries you with air, all at the push of a few buttons, is finding its way into almost all new bathrooms in Japan. It's planned that the next generation of this toilet will analyze your urine and measure body temperature, weight, blood pressure, and pulse. While this toilet may not become as universal as the VCR, it's like it in one important respect. It was invented in the USA in 1964 by the American Bidet Company and turned into a product by the Japanese. 
That's something that's been happening for a long time. Here's a quick review. In 1948, the transistor was invented at Bell Labs in the good old USA. By 1954, the radio began to get really small, so we got the Japanese to make them so they'd be really cheap. <laughs> they learned a lot. In 1979, Sony brought out the Walkman, kind of expensive, but really neat, really small, and really Japanese. Sony was making a lot of money in the good old USA, just about quit making radios altogether, but there sure were a lot of happy Americans running around with radios strapped to their heads. Oh. In 1956, Ampax developed the video recorder right here in the good old USA. By 1963, Neiman Marcus would sell you a home model for a mere $30,000, and not including the engineer to run it. Ampax decided that TV stations were the right market and sold top-of-the-line machines to them. Big profits. The home market machine too expensive. No one would buy one, so Ampax decided to license its technology to the Japanese. Big mistake. <laughs> in 1976, Sony, remember them, brought out the Betamax, selling for a mere $1,295, engineer not included. You could run it yourself at home. Uh, but that was before that little blinking and clock was added on. Other Japanese manufacturers said no to Beta. So also in 1976, KVC introduced the VHS format, and in a 10-year battle, Beta and VHS leapfrogged one another to put out a cheaper and better machine for the Japanese market, for you and for me and for just about everybody else on the planet. Today, no one in America is making VCRs, but just about everyone has a little piece of Japan right there in their living rooms. How do they do it? One explanation is that they work like hell and save like crazy. The Japanese work almost a full day a week more than we do. Also critical to Japan's success is their savings rate. The highest in the world. The average Japanese has 10 times as much in a savings account as the average American. And savings is a critical source of funds for investment in business. These habits hard work and big savings may not last, of course. Will these kids be willing to work so hard and save so much? Even the best educated young Japanese have caught the American disease. Many want to be investment bankers. But while the Japanese have overtaken us in many things, they still envy America's entrepreneurial zeal, the ability to create brand new products, an ability which continues to make some Americans enormously rich. One of them is Jaron Lanier, an inventor and entrepreneur who makes Silicon Valley his home. The room cube. Is there flying here? Yes. The white, the white cubes he invented the term virtual reality and is perfecting its technology. When you use virtual reality, the product disappears because all you see is the simulated world. <laughs> so it's the amazing disappearing product. I think some of what VPL's done has taken something that's been in science fiction books since science fiction began and made it a lot closer. So that I might be uh, wearing a data suit and just be um, making simple motions, but on, in the computer animation I'm driving, I might be a lobster. And these kind of little motions might be great big claw motions. It's a technology that lets you step into any three-dimensional world you want to, like following a drop of water downstream. Virtual reality is mostly heavy-duty software. Software, it takes time, money, and a lot of imagination. And that's also where the big bucks are. Three times as much profit comes from software as from hardware. And in software, Americans are way ahead of number two, the Europeans, and number three, the Japanese. Is virtual reality destined to become the next product invented in America and made in Japan? To make a new kind of physical product has been very challenging, and I think it's really brought to light that there isn't really that much of a manufacturing infrastructure in the United States anymore. We're sort of always sort of swimming upstream to get things done. And um, I visited manufacturing plants in some other countries, particularly in Asia, and um, there it's very different. There there is an infrastructure. Things just work more smoothly, all the right professionals are available for every stage and bringing an item to manufacture, all the right suppliers are in place, everything is just very smooth. Lanier couldn't find U.S. investors in his ideas or a U.S. market for his product. So he went, where else? To Japan. One application of Lanier's product can be found in an unlikely spot, a Matsushita department store, one of Tokyo's biggest. <laughs> Virtual reality sells kitchens. This sales clerk is taking a client and her interior designer on a shopping trip. She's being ushered into one of Jaron Lanier's 3D worlds, her very own $100,000 renovated kitchen. Once again, consumer becomes designer. 
願いしますじゃあこちらをまずつけていただくんですね。Oh my goodness, I put the goggles over my eyes. Oh, I thought I was just going to put it on my head. Wow, it's fabulous. Just fabulous. Oh, I didn't realize I'd be seeing it like this. As you move your glove, it will be as if you're touching a real kitchen. When we began developing this product, of course, the name virtual reality was not known in this society. It was a difficult decision as to whether this was going to be a meaningful service for our customers. When implementing a system like this, The top managers speculated that it would be a good investment. The decision to proceed with this project was made. We thought it would take at least five years to have any practical use. However, after early customer testing, we felt that this project could be fully designed and implemented in fewer than five years. The biggest reason for this was a good decision by top management to invest in an unknown product, something that happens in Japan very frequently. I see. Now please make a fist and grab the doorknob. You've just opened the cabinet. Oh, I see, I see. If you look up a little bit, you'll actually see inside the cabinet. Oh, that's good. Now if you let go, the door will shut automatically. Please move to the front of the sink and stove. Please check the height of the counter and the space. The space between the sink and the oven is very wide. It will allow me to put my ingredients down. There's enough room for me to put my cutting board and my knives down. It's a very ample space. I think it will be very easy to use. This is great. This is a very interesting experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New technologies like virtual reality are finding their way into Japanese society before Americans even hear about them. American inventors are finding not only markets and manufacturing capacity in Japan, but also the money they need to finance their research. During the 80s, raising money in the United States was not just difficult, it was, um, I would say, disturbing, because there was a lack of a belief in the original idea of what investment was supposed to be for. What I heard again and again from venture capitalists was, well, we're not so much interested in how well the company will do selling products. What we want is the company itself to be the product. We want the company to be able to be resold. We want to do a quick public offering. We want to do some kind of merger acquisition. We want to have some trick. <laughs> And the problem with tricks is that they're not productive. And if you have a certain amount of the money in a society going into non-productive tricks, then essentially what's happening is that money is not going through productive um, Things. You know, it's, it's, if a lot of the money is put to non-productive uses, then the society becomes unproductive. And I think that's exactly what happened in the 80s. It's hard for Wall Street to think in terms of patient, long-term capital. Wall Street gets paid for transactions, buying and selling. In the 1980s, money, instead of going into productive investments, uh, research and development, capital investment, Uh, went to buy and sell and sell and buy and buy and sell again in some cases uh, companies rather than into more productive uh, outlets. Paper entrepreneurs, adept at rearranging the slices of our economic pie, not making a bigger one, have forced American companies to think short term. Every time American corporations run into economic recession, they cut back on research and development 
they cut back on the manufacturing and process investments, they cut back on human labor training, human resources. Then, so when next time around market comes back, they are totally denuded. So that's the, and, and meanwhile, Japanese and European, particularly Japanese firms, continue to invest during the recession, continue to retrain workers during the recession, and, and be ready for the next phase of technological and market development. Some American companies are preparing for the future by mimicking the Japanese in more ways than one. Norman Newrider has come here to head Texas Instruments operations in Japan. He's leading a major effort by Texas Instruments to tap the skills of the Japanese workforce. Texas Instruments is headquartered in Dallas, but it has operations all over the world. Its computer chip foundry near Tokyo is a joint venture with a Japanese steel company. Markets are global today. Most products have global markets, but particularly this one is truly a transnational industry, a global industry, and I think that's the biggest issue that all of us face. How to organize, how to invest, how to manage, uh, how to do the R&D, uh, where to get the people and so on to carry on one's business on a totally worldwide basis. When you've got 50 percent or 40 percent of the world's semiconductor market here, when you have the heart of most of the world's consumer electronics industry here, and the intense competition, domestic competition among these Japanese companies is really driving the state of a lot of this miniaturized technology, it's very important to have enough technical people here so that you really know what's going on and that you can be a part of it. Texas Instruments employs over 5,000 Japanese researchers, engineers, and technicians who will help keep Texas Instruments a strong global company. In competing with Japan, you are competing with the, the best educated, lower 50% of the population in the world. What that really means is that you have people who are at the supporting levels of your industrial structure who are really equipped to, with all of those basic skills. They, they can read, they can concentrate, they can do the arithmetic and so on. Is Texas Instruments selling out to the Japanese by tapping this talent pool? No more than IBM, Kodak, or even entrepreneurs like Jaron Lanier who have come to Japan. They are here to compete in the world's premier high-tech consumer marketplace. More and more of the capability, the end product, whether it's a camera or a video player or a radio or whatever it may be, more and more of the functions of that electronic equipment go into the silicon itself, go directly into the chip. And so you've got to work with your customer very closely from the beginning to design a specific part for his product. That's what serving the local market really means in today's semiconductor world. But Texas Instruments is doing more in Japan than making and selling chips to its Japanese customers. It hopes this brand new research and development center in Japan's Science City, just outside Tokyo, will be the source of some of its most creative ideas, leading to products it can sell worldwide. And here we enter the first floor of the, uh, of the research center. And probably one of the things that, uh, that is perhaps unique is the escalator. Um, this is fairly new for a TI research center. And the reason we have an escalator instead of uh, stairways and elevators uh, is that studies uh, showed that researchers will interact if, uh, between floors if there is an escalator. But if there's not, they, there seems to be some barrier to using the stairway or the elevator. So that's the purpose for this uh, particular uh, escalator. Most of the facility is currently empty, but Texas Instruments hopes the cream of the crop of Japanese researchers will soon be working here. A very important capability that we have is almost instantaneous communications with Texas Instruments operations worldwide. Uh, we use satellite communications for data links and uh, uh, Kato-san can send a message here and have it immediately appear on the uh, display 
of uh, his colleague in Dallas or in England or, or some other TI location. Texas Instruments knows, as do other American companies, that in order to keep doing quality research and development, they have to use the best scientific and engineering talent they can find anywhere in the world and place R&D facilities close to their markets. Here in TI, for instance, we have over 5,000 Japanese on our staffs. We only have a handful of Americans who work here. So in one sense, we have a kind of Japanese company, but it's part of an American institution which to a large extent today has globalized. The point is, if you can't serve the markets outside the U.S. effectively, you will never have the production volumes, you will never have the activity, you will never be enough of a participant in the total world market so that your U.S. component will say stay strong. So it's absolutely vital to play on a global scale so that the, the U.S element of that remains vital, active, and vigorous. That's just absolutely critical. Texas Instruments is just one of many American companies becoming global, doing research and production around the world. But as American companies move beyond our borders, most American workers still remain behind at home in America. What can we do to make sure they get good jobs in the new global economy? Now, yes, we have to ensure that other nations play fair, but in this new era, protecting the American market from foreign competition doesn't necessarily strengthen the American workforce. It may even weaken it. Consider the latest chapter in the saga of American computers. Jim Hurd's company is doing a lot right. Planar Systems produces one kind of flat panel display that's well suited for industrial and medical applications. Let's start today's meeting by reviewing our Ishikawa diagram. We'll be reviewing our spec matrix. The company is well managed and incorporates a lot of the business practices that have made the Japanese successful. See, I've gotten a two different... But Heard finds competing with large, rich Japanese companies a difficult struggle. The computer market is a very appealing market to the Japanese manufacturers. High volume business, uh, very strategically important products uh, for their future. And so they will really go in and try to tie up notebooks, portables, desktops, workstations, anything uh, in that area. And that effectively closes uh, that market off from our ability to compete. As a small company, uh, we don't have the ability to go in and lose money for five years. Uh, and the Japanese uh, have acknowledged that they expect to lose money for five years in this area. Herd's company can't lose money for five years. His shareholders and Wall Street wouldn't permit it. A great deal is at stake for the American workforce here. Flat panel displays are a multi-billion dollar industry. This technology is critical to those new small televisions, laptop computers, and many products just around the corner. Workers with know-how and experience in this field will be making it well into the next century. These displays are the hottest pieces of the computer's hardware. If you look at a typical laptop, you see that even when they carry the names of American companies, three times as much value comes from the Pacific Rim as from the United States. Currently, Japanese workers are making most of these critical flat panels and are gaining the know-how they need to develop the next generation displays. Heard led a trade association complaint against the Japanese for dumping flat panels in the U.S. Dumping is legally defined as selling in the U.S. at less than fair market value. It's one of our most frequent grievances against the Japanese, and anti-dumping laws are enforced by the U.S. government. The, the fact of the matter is that the U.S. market is wide open to every competitor, and foreign markets are closed in various degrees to U.S. manufacturing. As a result of that, uh, the U.S. market is viewed as an open bazaar. And as a result of that, U.S. manufacturers, U.S. companies are going to have an increasingly difficult time competing against foreign companies in this market. And as a result of that, there's going to have to be changes in, uh, in the enforcement of our trade policies and the creation of our trade policies, because predatory pricing is taking people out on a daily basis. Heard won his dumping case, but it may have backfired on American workers. 
American companies like Apple moved some of their laptop assembly operations out of America so they could continue to buy Japanese-made panels cheaply. More critical American jobs have been lost. When we think of our global competitors, we typically think of Japan and Germany. But what about the rest of the world? Can a poor country trying to industrialize compete with us? You bet. This is Malaysia, in many ways still a third world nation. <laughs> Companies used to come here for cheap labor.